Thank you. Ms. Hoffman, if you'll read the TV coverage announcement. Here. Thank you. And now, Ms. Black, if you'll do the agenda status report, followed by the projection report. Temporary hold. You're not live yet. That's all right. <laughs> so, uh, repeat anything, I'd be happy to. Um, so, um, Mr. Chair, this morning we have um, three items on the C agenda and three items on the regular agenda. We're proposing to continue item C3 to May 6th. Um, and we are proposing to continue item number one to June 17th. Those two will be on the agenda of the regular agenda. 
Okay, would it be appropriate if we go ahead and make a motion right now to move those two items to those dates? And then I will I will make the motion to move item uh, C3 to May 6th and item 1 to June 17th. Thank you. Any discussion or comments from the commission? S Commissioner Cooney. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just think it would be helpful to we're about ready to solve our technical difficulty it's not, it's not going to be continued should be good now okay and uh, item C1 is the uh, Merahabian appeal of the Huxford Merrill Horse Arena yep. oh, excuse me that's the uh, regular item um, the other consent or item Orchid is Creek, Orchid Creek time extension. Mr. Cooney, have other comments, sir? No, that's fine. I'm ready to still on. Okay, good. Then, uh, Ms. Hopwood, uh, if you read the roll call. Commissioner Cooney? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Brooks? Aye. Commissioner Valencia? Aye. Commissioner Blau? Aye. Vote carries 5 0. Thank you. And just for the record, the uh, two items, that, the other two items which are listed are consent are being pulled from the consent calendar. It will be heard uh, separately. Okay. So if you'll continue with the. Uh yes. Mr. Chair, as to the projection report, next week, um, April 15th, we'll be having the Planning Commission retreat. That's going to be held at the Long Lompoc Veter Veterans Memorial Building um, and will begin at 9 30 in the morning. And I expect it to go to mid afternoon. Um, the morning will mainly be training and then some other items will happen after we have lunch. Next meeting um, scheduled for the Planning Commission is a special hearing on May 4th, which is a Monday. And that will be your first hearing on the Santinez Community Plan and we are going to be holding that hearing in this room. May 6th is a regular meeting of your Planning Commission. That's um, a hearing that will be held in Santa Barbara and as you can see that uh, agenda is um, pretty full. May 13th um, is our regular Planning Commission meeting date and that hearing will be reserved for the San Inez Community Plan and it will be held at the Solving Veterans Memorial Building in um, Solving. May 20th, um, we have no items uh, projected for that date and at this point I'm going to um, mark that as a potentially canceled date. I'm pretty sure we will not be having a planning commission hearing that day. The next meeting um, will be on a regular Wednesday and it's again a special hearing for the Santinez community plan on June 3rd. And um, we still have not um, made a determination as to whether that hearing should be in Santa Barbara or Santa Maria and we were going to wait and see um, what happened at the first two hearings. So that, that's an easy uh, decision to make once we, or uh, easy decision to implement what, once it's made. June 10th, we had scheduled as a hearing in Santa Barbara. Um, June 17th, uh, we'll be again meeting up in Santa Maria. So we're switching the uh, North County hearing dates around a bit because Commissioner Cooney will be absent that day and um, there were some items on June 10th that we thought he should be there for. And then again we have a <coughs> special hearing on um, June 29th for the Santinez Community Plan. That's a Monday and again that uh, location is to be determined. It'll either be in Santa Barbara or in Santa Maria. And that's pretty much as far as we've projected out at this point. Any questions or comments from commissioners? Just, uh, I had just had um, a, qu a question on the um, botanic garden. I, I'm not sure where the documentation is on that. Is it fairly extensive? Um, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Brown, there's a original EIR and a recirculated EIR on the project, and I think we'll, there will be a fairly extensive staff okay. report. Is so we'll try and get it to you. Yeah, early. if we could just get the EIRs, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. okay, I see no other lights on. So at this time, we will ask for uh, it, the opportunity for anyone to make public comment on any item not on today's agenda. 
I have no speaker slips. I see no one from the audience. So we'll move on to Planning Commissioner's informational reports. Seeing no lights, we'll move on to the director's report and the, uh, or excuse me, planning and development divisional briefings. Mr. Chair, we don't have any briefings this morning. Great. Then we'll move to the director's report. Mr. Baker, good morning. Mr. Chair and members of the commission, uh, first of all, because of your technical difficulties, we didn't hear some of the actions that you took in terms of saying that they would be carried over or what. So could you, there are people sure. in the audience sure. here that we need to have that restated for us. Please. We are continuing the consent item, which is the Oak Creek Estates time, ex excuse me, that regular item, the Oak Creek Estates time extension. Well, that is a continue, that is a consent item. And then we're, cons uh, in the standard agenda item one, which is the Merrill Horse Arena. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So there's no one here on either of those items. Uh, in terms of uh, my report, the first item I'm going to report on is actually not a planning commission item, but a Montecito planning commission item. But I thought it was a, a fairly significant one, and that's that the, uh, the Miramar Hotel, they put out a press release yesterday saying that they had reached agreement with, uh, with adjacent neighbors on, with regard to some issues that were raised and, and placed into a lawsuit and a appeal to the planning commission. Those have been withdrawn, so Miramar is essentially in a, now into the queue to, uh, to start some of their activities out there. And still got a lot of things to do, but it's, uh, and Diane can explain all of those if you're really interested, but I just thought it was uh, countywide interest, so I would report it here this morning. Secondly, on the uh, item from yesterday's agenda, uh, not something that you dealt with, but SB 170, which dealt with uh, uh, ag preserve lands and dealing with uh, the Chumash tribe, the board voted uh, a four to one to send a letter opposing that. Essentially, was to give the SB 170, if it were to be approved, would be providing uh, Indian tribes with the same abilities that a city uh, or a county might have with regard to cancellation of uh, agricultural preserves and the board took a position that they do not want that uh, kind of a provision to take place. Uh, and there was an offshore oil resolution yesterday again which was not something you've dealt with but was uh, uh, not a, it was approved by the board also. So uh, if there are any questions I'd be happy to try and answer them. I see no questions. Right, thank you. Now we will go to the uh, first item on the consent calendar, which is taken off the consent calendar to be heard. So Ms. Hoppen, would you read item C1 to the record, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The following is a hearing on the request of the County Executive Office to consider case numbers 08RMM6 and 08RVP9, applications filed on August 27, 2008, and to accept 01EIR03 as adequate environmental review for case numbers 08RVP9 and 08RMM6 pursuant to section 15162 of the state guidelines for implementation of CEQA. Thank you. And now I'll ask my fellow commissioners for ex parte on uh, site visit disclosures. Um, I don't, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you, Chair Blau. Um, I was part of the uh, subcommittee, but unfortunately I was out of town when the uh, first meeting was held. And I did not um, have any other opportunity, you know, to meet with uh, Providence Landing, the Homeowners Association, nor did I receive any phone calls. I had some uh, conversations with Mr. Baker and yourself. Thank you. Okay, great. And for my, um, I had lots of conversations with everybody. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> this is the time we would normally have a staff presentation. I don't think there is one, except that uh, I will ha I will brief the commission on what I've been doing for the past couple of weeks, trying to work out. Um, the issues, but before I do that, I'd like to invite Mr. Ford back up because uh, we had some discussions this week as to what the procedure should or shouldn't be taking this forward, and we're not sure that this is actually an action that we, or I would take an action on other than maybe to make a recommendation to the board. Um, so, Mr. Baker, if you would be so kind as to step forward and explain that to us, I'd appreciate it. Chair, uh, as you and I have discussed, and and I have briefly discussed it with. 
uh, Rel also, that uh, there's been kind of a change in direction in terms of the, this process, and if that change in direction continues, it would be to not disp uh, have the HOA take over the park, but in fact that the county would accept the park, and that the HOA would contract back with the county for the operation of the park. And I won't go into all the details that that would entail, but if that process continues, then the planning commission would actually be not the decision maker anymore, but they would be contract agreements that would go between the county and CPH and the county and HOA in terms of the operation and the maintenance of that park. Uh, this would maintain the county being there in the event that there was any default down the, down the line that the county park would be maintained uh, in, in place and it would be a responsibility of the county to see that it was maintained uh, in a proper order. So that's in summary uh, what we are maybe looking at today. Uh, if you want details of those discussions, uh, you can provide them, and I've, I've provided some of that input also. Great. The only question I would have for you, and maybe for Ms. Madden-Bowen, is in the original track map conditions, it required, well, I should say that, it, yeah, it requires the developer to continue to pay into the CFD fund for undeveloped lots uh, for a time period that's limited to three years. And I think what one of the things that we wanted to change was that condition that it not be limited to three years, that they would pay um, forever, uh, whatever the CFD assessment amount was for the maintenance of the park. So I need to know if that requires a modification to the track map conditions and if the commission needs to make that recommendation or if the board can simply do it by themselves. Mr. Chair, yes, uh, I, I might respond to that. Uh, I don't think Ms. Van Mellen maybe has that background. The the agreement with CPH was an agreement between the county and CPH, and it's not part of the track map conditions. This was done after as a part of the CFD uh, negotiations. Um, okay, if, maybe we could just read those track map conditions to make sure, because that's not the way I read it when I went through it, and I could be wrong. Hopefully I am. Yeah, the information that I gave to you was the agreement between the county and CPH, okay. and uh, again, it was not track map, but but a, a separate agreement. Okay, great, thank you. Um, to, to go ahead and just yes, Commissioner Valencia. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Uh, did I hear correctly that the developer would pay forever on the maintenance of the park? No, it, it just simply pays into the fund like the other homeowners. The way the the way the original agreement was structured. They only paid on the undeveloped lots for a period of three years. Mm -hmm. This way, is going to pay the same as a homeowner would pay with a built house, you and know, and there, and there yes, would not be a limitation. Yes. Yeah, and I did confirm by email with the developer this morning that that, that is their understanding. Okay. So here are a couple of the issues that, that I think I need to make everybody aware of and get consensus on. Um, the original agreement also called that the developer was going to pay 300 and I believe it was about $70,000 when the park was given over to the CFD. And the idea behind that was that uh, it, that was a that was everybody's guess as to what the original budget was to maintain the park for a year. And they wanted to have enough money in the coffers to be able to pay it and allow time to collect the assessments through the property tax assessments. Well, the reality is is the developer since March of last year has paid all the cost to maintain the park. So they've actually paid the cost to maintain that, paid to that park for more than a year. And since that time, the county has done two annual assessments of, the, of all the 266 lots. So it now has, or will have with the payment of the next tax cycle, something around $270,000 in collected funds that, have, that would be turned over to the HOA for the maintenance of the park. In addition to that, the developer has agreed to put up $100,000 as a contribution, um, assuming we can get this done before, I think it's the 1st of June. They have some difficulty paying it after the 1st of June. And again, I'm sure part of that's the fact that they would, they're would they still maintaining the park and paying the fees. It's just not been taken over by anybody else yet. 
So I think we need to understand that that's probably a fair arrangement, that they don't have to pay the 377, that since they have maintained it for a year and money's been collected and they're putting up 100,000, that would be a fair arrangement. The rest of the issues, um, I think, are pretty well resolved between the HOA and the county with the exception of it was contemplated that the county would charge the CFD for its cost in actually doing the assessments, collecting the money through the tax program and so forth, and I'm proposing that the county not be reimbursed for that. Uh, prior to this arrangement, the county was going to make a contribution of $75,000 a year toward the maintenance of the park, but with this arrangement, they're not going to be making any contribution, that the Owners Association are going to pay the entire cost of the park. And since this is a public park, um, I don't think it's unreasonable that the county uh, provide the oversight through the Parks Department and provide the uh, assessment and collection of the fees as their contribution. It's way far less than $75,000. It's a few thousand dollars, is my best guess. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be my recommendation that this commission recommend to the board that any of those fees be waived, uh, that that's the county's contribution toward the public park. And again, I guess there was also a two years worth of budgeted 75,000 payments, neither of which have been made nor will be made. So I, I think it's a very equitable deal on, on everybody's part. The final remaining issues between the Owners Association and the county would be simply the, the language in the actual management document for the HOA. And in emails between John Baker, myself, and the HOA, I think we have all the issues resolved to the point that the county council could draft agreements and get final approval from all the parties. But I don't think it needs to be come back to us. It's just, it's more legalese and more of those kinds of issues. So. Commissioner Valencia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, uh, in the final analysis, the HOA was paying a certain amount. Are they going to be paying less or are they going to be paying the same? Part of this uh, wanting to enter into a new plan was to go from 13 or 1400 to $950. <coughs> And uh, what is the I think that, that I think they'll be consider they will pay be paying considerably less. If you remember, um, legal counsel at our last meeting um, cautioned us that one of the problems with doing the CFD was this issue of paying prevailing wage, and there was some concern that the prevailing wage would be much higher uh, because of the county's involvement in the funding. Well, come to find out, the prevailing wage for a, a landscape maintenance person. In this county is 8.59 per hour. The county employee doing the same job gets 17.50 per hour, plus about a 45 percent package of benefits and load. So it basically was costing the the park about three times the cost of prevailing wage. So I think that's fair to say that it will be a lot less for them to pay. In addition to that, they've got some pretty extensive plans for user fees that are commensurate with other parks in the county. They've got a lot of volunteers that were going to be doing fundraising and other issues, trying to create an endowment, renaming the park. So I think over time, uh, their cost to operate could be considerably less than what it costs today, and way less than what was projected by the, the Parks Department when this project was first put together. Uh, so, Commissioner Brown. Um. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I appreciate all the work that you've done on this because I'm sure it's been considerable. The, the question I have is, how, how is most of what you are describing in documents outside of planning documents? These agreements about how it was going to operate or maybe miss they, ha they haven't really been developed yet. There's been correspondence okay. gone back and forth between okay. Mr. Baker's office, between the developer, between the HOA okay. and myself. Um, but they're... <laughs> They're really just trying to, t I would call them uh, business points or deal okay. points, okay. Uh, so we can kind of define uh, the issues before a final document is approved. Okay. Now, obviously, the board has to recommend or has to approve this document. I just want to get recommendation on those items that I just outlined okay. Okay. Uh, so that when Mr. Baker presents this to the board, he can say there was extensive discussion, commission's in agreement with the basic terms and conditions. If, if it wouldn't delay anything, could when those are finalized, can we see them coming back to us? Uh, so I, I think as, I, as an informational briefing in the future, I will bring that back to you. And it will obviously be at a time prior to the board actually voting on it. So if there's additional right. comments we want to make, we could make right. those. Okay. Part of the concern is, and I, I'm not sure, sure how real this is, but probably is pretty real. 
The developer CHP is telling me that if we don't get this done by right. the first of June, it's going to be difficult for them to make the contribution. And so I, and I think that's reasonable. And I think they need to stop paying the actual maintenance of the park and allow the entity to start doing it. Okay. Mr. Brooks. Yes, thank you, Chair Blau. Um, again, I was not uh, privy to some of this information. I have gotten some of the background documents. Um, I'm just, uh, I, I guess I would urge um, my chair to make sure that the third district uh, is perhaps a little bit more actively involved in whatever meetings are coming up. I know that Mr. Baker had a, a conversation with Supervisor Farr, and um, she does want to, you know, be kept abreast of this and I too you know would like to get a little bit more involved just to build up my own background in case it has to come back to the Planning Commission in any way shape or form so uh, that's just a, a suggestion I'd like to put out there great thing Thank what you. I'd like to suggest is I'll make myself available to you and uh, Supervisor Farr once we have a draft agreement of the um, management agreement between the HOA and the and the CFD uh, or whatever entity it ends up being. There's there's some concern, and some one of the lawyers thinks that maybe a CFD is not appropriate, should be an assessment district instead, but it's, you know, who cares. Um, but I'll be more than happy to do that, and I think that'd probably be pretty helpful. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Great. Okay, I need to um, now ask if there's no further questions. Oh, excuse me, Commissioner Cooney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <clears throat> my concern is just that uh, we fulfill the obligation uh, attributable to the Planning Commission the original staff report um, for our November 12 hearing said that um, uh, <clears throat> the uh, county code section 21-15.9G requires any proposed modification of a final map uh, to uh, come before the planning commission. And also it indicates that um, we have a role in uh, <clears throat> the subdivision map and development map plans if they are to be modified. I, um, I realize there's uh, a lot of process going on now. I just want to be sure that uh, if we're not going to have any further hearings before the commission, we have satisfied all the requirements of our codes. Yeah, and I think that's, that's well advised, and that's why I asked the question of Ms. Van Willen, Mr. Baker, at the beginning. So you know what I'd like to do is I'd like to trail this to the end of this meeting to give them opportunity to make sure that we don't have that same concern. What Mr. Baker's telling us is that there is, this is an agreement that's outside the map and outside the uh, plan, plan development permit that was made with the board and therefore doesn't require our action. I, I'd like Ms. Van Mullen and Mr. Baker to make sh darn sure that's right and we'll, we'll make the determination of the recommendation at the end of this meeting. Will that be acceptable? Great. Mr. Uh, Chair? Uh, oh, yes. Mike Ledbetter, County Council. Mr. Baker and I have gone over the uh, conditions right now, and uh, the only condition is uh, as follows. Prior to recordation of the tract map, the applicant or project developer shall enter into a recorded agreement with the county and park operator to special specify what park-related improvements the applicant or project developer will be responsible for providing. So there won't be a modification to the map or to the conditions, just the agreement will change wanted to point that out in response to Commissioner Cooney's question. Great. Commissioner Cooney, do you have further comment or questions? I know. So, Mr. Ledbetter, uh, <clears throat> it, in your view, then, uh, the role of the Planning Commission in this process has been fulfilled? Correct. All right. Thank I you. I think it's a good idea for the matter to come back to you for review before it goes to the board so that you can um, make your comments and uh, those comments can then be presented to the board along with the item. Uh, let me ask the question if we can get uh, it scheduled for the board so that there's a chance it'd be heard before June the 1st. Uh, I'm not sure that that can occur, but uh, we can try our best. Okay, thank you. All right, now I'll ask if there's anyone that, from the public that wants to comment on this item. Uh, no, no speaker slips, Mr. Chair. I have one from Mikey, Mickey Flaps, but I'm not sure what is. Uh, that's something different. Yeah. Okay, because there's no issue on here. So he wants to speak on item number two on your regular agenda. Great, thank you. All right. That being the case, I'll 
where, where we're going to chair we're going to trail this to the well we don't need to trail it now i guess we can go ahead and uh should we continue it to another date and uh and just to make sure we have it on our agenda so that we can deal with it um, before june one Uh, yes. Jay Higgins is in the audience with me down here in Santa Barbara. Oh, great. Uh, he, he acknowledges that, that just doing the, the contracts and such and getting them to the board by June 1 is going to be highly unlikely, frankly, just, just working it through their attorney and our attorneys. Uh, but he says, you know, that they are willing to, to, to work around this in terms of the contribution so that it would be put into escrow, essentially putting into the CFD account. Uh, so that it was there before June 1. It's it's a budget issue for them. Great. That solves that problem. So we'll go ahead and uh, continue this item to the next Planning Commission hearing. Uh, well, Mr. Baker, if you could tell me how long you think it would be before we would see um, the agreement that's going to be forwarded to the board. I'm, Mr. Chair, I'm guessing that you might see something in, in the month of June before it goes to the board. Uh, but I can't speak for the county council and the attorneys for CPH in terms of that working. So are there any attorneys that might be representing the HOA? So, I mean, but that would be our attempt is to try and get it to you during the month of June. And can you go ahead and get the item in the queue for the board for the month of June? So it's not, you know, typically when we break with the board, it's sometimes it's six to eight weeks before the board hears it after we push it on. Once I would put it in the queue once I'm confident of what essentially confident what that date might be so we will put it in the queue as uh, and it'll be in the queue before it gets to you uh, but whether it be in the queue for june i'm not i can't promise that okay great then miss black if you could suggest a date for the continuance mr chair you're meeting um in santa maria on june 17th so you could continue it to june 17th alternatively in june you're meeting on june 10th in santa barbara those are really the only options in June. Yeah, I think it's about half of them in Santa Barbara, one or two. But it's, it, I would I would go for the Santa Barbara June 10th hearing okay. with my recommendation for continuance. So I'll make that motion. Well, uh, second, Mr. Chair. With Thank a question. You. Sure. What, uh, what happens to the Melrose District now? Uh, if the county's going to take over the park, it still continues in place? Yeah, it, it's not so much the county taking over the park. The Melrose stays in place. It's just who owns the park. Right now, the developer owns the actual fee interest, so they would deed it to the county, but the Melrose still is in effect. Will still effect. continue right. to, for its collection of funds. Okay, right. thank you. And just to remind you, the, the kind of the purpose for that was uh, this still gives the county some mm, ability to come in and take over the park if for some reason they were to not maintain it correctly or if there was a health and safety issue. Uh, but I don't think there's much chance of that happening. It also is a big benefit to the um, association because they no longer risk losing their assessment dollars through foreclosures. So the road will remain as required by a recorded agreement, an enforceable recorded agreement. But finally, the reality is that even if the creek bank were to erode and the parties took no steps to prevent that, the land use permit approval of this hay barn will not in itself create any kind of impediment or constraint to moving the road over. And that's because those impediments already exist. They existed before the parcel map. They existed before this county had permitting authority. The impediments are in the form of the two large eucalyptus trees that actually lie between the road and the barn. And the old hay barn, or the old, old what they called pig barn slab that has a substantial curb on it, an, an old concrete slab. And the hay barn is built directly over that slab. So even if the hay barn, that is the roof were taken off, the impediment would remain. So the King, has, the King family has the right to continue to use that slab for uses that would obstruct the road. In short, denying the land use permit hurts an agricultural family's operation and it doesn't really help the shellers one bit. I want to make, in conclusion, a, a request that comes directly from the King family and they were unable to speak about this because they feel so strongly about it. 
The Kings live off farming and ranching. They are true farming families. They don't have oil subsidies. They live off their hard work as farmers and ranchers. They need this hay barn. They can't afford to build a replacement. It's raining today. Their hay is safe today. If you make them remove this barn, then they have to build another one because they have to have this. So I'm begging you on behalf of this farming family to support their efforts to preserve their agricultural operation and lifestyle. Agriculture is the lifeblood of this county. These folks work long, arduous hours. Without them and others like them, our rural lands would be in serious danger of subdivision and urbanization. Your action on what might appear to be a simple land use permit for a hay barn actually sends a message to dedicated farmers and ranchers. Your action is a statement that you either support their struggle, struggles to remain in agriculture or that instead you support division of larger agricultural land holdings. I don't think there's any, any issue, any secret, that the Shellers marketing of this property for subdivision is the impetus for this appeal. That barn has sat there for over 20 years with their, the Shellers having no objection. I mean, they bought hay out of that barn. They borrowed hay out of that barn. Um, subdivision, of course, is the Shellers' right, but assuming that the county approves it. But please, don't make the King family pay the price. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll ask, one second. Now I'll ask, is any public, anyone from the public that wants to comment on this? No slips, no hands. Okay, very good. Then we'll ask for the uh, appellant's rebuttal. Thank you, Chair Blau, members of the commission. Um, the issue is pretty straightforward. It, would the commission authorize the construction of a permanent structure in a dedicated easement on a track map? which is contrary to the provisions of that track map. That right-of-way is to be re reserved for ingress, egress, water, and utilities. And it, it strikes me that someone that built an illegal barn that didn't go through the permit process uh, is asking you, the commission, to place them in a preferential position uh, with respect to somebody that had would follow the law and seek a permit to build such a structure. Remember, this barn takes up about two-thirds of the right-of-way, some 54 feet. And if, if that person came in to the planning department for a permit, um, I think we learned over the two hearings that we had on this subject that that permit would not be granted for that location. That's what the case is all about. The Kings are longtime farmers and ranchers in this county. So are the Shellers. Uh, this is not about a subdivision. It's about a barn being built in a track map dedicated easement. And so I think you're finding the finding that staff has uh, put together is appropriate. It's certainly supported by the evidence. The creek erosion, if you will recall, there was a geotechnical report that was prepared by Earth Sciences and uh, on behalf of Mr. Scheller, and he found that there was indeed uh, significant potential for erosion that would further reduce the right-of-way. So uh, again, we ask you to finalize the conceptual motion that you approved on January 28th. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Petrovich, or perhaps the um, applicant wishes to speak again. Do I see a slip from Mr. King? Mr. Chair, um, before Mr. King speaks, if I could just, I just want to make one statement, and that is that Mr. Kirby is incorrect because your staff did grant this land use permit, and it would have gone through absent the appeal. So whether they had done it in the 80s or whether they did it today, the staff, I believe, would and did 
grant a permit for this barn. And they were told when they went in in the 80s they didn't need a permit. Uh, that was their mistake, staff's mistake, but that's what they were told. So Mr. King, I think, just wants to say a couple words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I prefaced, last time I got up here, I prefaced my statements by saying I'm a lousy public speaker. That hasn't changed. Uh, I really wasn't going to speak. I, I just object to the term illegal barn. Now, I personally, in 1988, applied for a, or asked if we needed a building permit. I was told no. The size wasn't there. There's no electricity, no water. And now all of a sudden this land use permit, that I'd never heard of one in 1988, nobody ever said anything, so I don't, I take exception to being called illegal when, you know, in fact, to this day I've never seen in writing that we needed a land use permit. I'd like to see it. I've heard I think so, you know, and stuff like that. But this, this was the repair and, and replacement of an existing thing that had been there for a hundred years almost. You know, there's no issue here. I mean. You're spending your time, and we're spending our time, and gobs of money, but this is a contrived issue. It's obvious. They want it moved, so it helps sell the ranch. Well, that's, I, I have no objection to the sale or what they ask. It's none of my business. But God, not on, the, not on, the, on our shoulders, for God's sake. It's just ridiculous. I, I don't know what it takes to impress people. This is a sham. I'm sorry. Get me out here before I say something I shouldn't. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. King. Mr. King, Mr. Chair, could I ask him a question? Mr. Uh, your Mr. King, Mr. Vo Commissioner Clinch has a question for you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Excuse King, me. Mr. King, you and Mr. Scheller supposedly have been talking with attorneys over this situation. Yes, and, and spending my, a lot of money. Yeah, and my understanding is when I went and spoke to Mr. Scheller, now I don't, I don't think I can resolve it here, but I'd like to clarify some things. He said that he was willing to contribute to help move the barn. Was that yes, he said that quite often, but he, he does, doesn't. Well, it, it, we well, have offered to, to you know, well, to pay half the removal of it against our better judgment. We don't feel that it should be moved at all. But he's turned us down and, every and, time. And, he and, changes his tune every every time you talk to him. Okay, and maybe we can have Mr. Scheller speak to Mr. Chair. Maybe we can have Mr. Scheller speak to that before, because we we made a conceptual motion some time back, and we probably should be sticking to that. But uh, we'll ask that question later. But perhaps would you object to Mr. Scheller coming up and absolutely not, Mr. Chair? No, would that be appropriate? If I, if I get a speaker slip, speaker slip for Mr. Scheller, he'd be more than happy to come up. I do have one from Mrs. Scheller. Thank you, Mr. King, for done? clarifying that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Sherry Scheller. <clears throat> I'm Sherry Scheller. My husband is Carson Scheller, and he is successor trustee for um, his siblings and their spouses and their children, and therefore uh, me and our daughter. And at the time that my father-in-law died in 2006, well, I have to back up. It's necessary that we sell the ranch. The, um, it's 47% of appraised value that is owing to the IRS. And it's necessary to sell it, so it's been on the market. The, um, this, the structure on this dedicated easement is an impediment and, an, and a deterrent to the ability to sell these 1737 acres. It wasn't there was no malintent. We acknowledge that in the building of the barn. It was a mistake. It was, and, and my opinion is it was a mistake, the issuance of a permit for the barn after the 1737 acres were sold without the structure erected. And like I say, there was no malintent. It's, it, it's just, it's a mistake that can be corrected by the denial of the permit. Um, so I had other thoughts, but thanks. Great, thank you. Seeing no other speakers, I'll close it to public hearing, bring it back to the commission for questions. Does the commission have any questions of the staff? 
Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Commissioner Valencia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I have this of County Council. Since we passed a conceptual motion, conceptually, at the last time to uh, approve the appeal, I believe, uh, are we, what, what is the role of the commission at this point? Let me just leave it open so that you can comment. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Valencia, um, your commission has the discretion to approve or deny. Uh, still at, at this point. Still at this point. You're not bound by your conceptual motion. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, it seems to me that when these folks are out of this meeting, if I, if I may continue. Please. If, uh, that when these folks are out trying to uh, find a way to communicate, there seems to be an obstacle of some sort, but yet when they come to this meeting, uh, one party seems, if, you know, we can get some help in correcting this problem, we're, we're willing to do that. And the other side seems to say that the same thing, but yet it's not being done and I don't understand. Is it that we have too many attorneys <laughs> in, in the process or that they're just not talking to each other? But uh, I, I, the way I feel now is I, I think there is a solution here. I think that uh, it wouldn't cost much to take a portion of this building down and continue it on. I mean, there is property beyond that. And in looking at the uh, hay barn, when the slab was put in, now the slab is broken and the top of the hay barn has uh, parts that are in disrepair. It probably needs some repair. So if it was cut, and I'm not trying to tell him how to do his, Mr. King, how to run his business, but if, if there was a participation by the shellers to help cut this building in half and continue it on, I think that would be the thing to do outside of the realm of this planning commission. But if they're not willing to do that, we have to look at the letter of the law and look at can you build on an easement that there's two parties involved in there. And I think that there is a problem there. So with that, um, I'd like to hear from my fellow commissioners, Mr. Chair. Okay. Commissioner Brooks. Thank you, Chair Blau. Um, I was writing my notes for this uh, case this uh, last night, and I pulled out my notes from our hearing previously. And I guess there's nothing that's been done that would make me change, you know, my opinion on this. Um, I had voted to deny the appeal, and what I was looking at when I made the visitation to the uh, property, um, you know, I'm looking at the two eucalyptus trees. I don't know. You know, it, when we talk about impediments, it's, they're certainly quite obvious. The other thing I noticed when, as we talk about the definition of the easement and the width of the easement, when you turn into go, uh, the King's property, um, there's an active field, agricultural field there. And I believe if we're talking about the difference between a 20-foot easement and a 75-foot easement, then that field is in the easement. I mean, that that's active agriculture that's going on. So there's just so many arguments that lend me to believe that for years and years, you know, this 20, 20 foot easement was adequate. Uh, I'm really disappointed, you know, the two parties couldn't come to some kind of agreement. You know, I don't like being up here um, having to make this decision and uh, it's a difficult one. But again, I go back to the staff report. And um, I, when I read the staff report months ago, you know, it seemed that, you know, that was the interpretation you know, of county staff as far as, you know, the, the width of the easement. Um, the idea that the creek might spill someday, uh, you know, I, I, I guess that, that could happen. I don't know if it's happened, but there's also evidence that the creek, uh, you know, further up the hill, and that would be, I guess, on the Scheller property, you know, there's more uh, problems with existing buildings up there than down in the area you know, where it abuts the King's property. Um, so I, I, I have not changed, you know, uh, my interpretation of what has happened, and I would probably, you know, go along with what was in the staff report. Um, I thought that uh, the letter that I read yesterday, you know, had some very compelling arguments, but it lends me to stick to my original uh, stance that, I, you know, I would vote to deny the appeal. Commissioner Cooney. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, like uh, Commissioner Brooks, I have um, 
uh, reconsidered my uh, views of uh, the original hearings on this matter um, very carefully. Uh, once I was told by Mr. Kirby that uh, resolution between the parties had not been reached, um, it, it disappointed me uh, because uh, I very much feel that these neighbors who have cooperated for generations uh, have come to this impasse uh, over the location of a single building um, which uh, is seen by the easement holder to be an impediment to sale of the property. Um, regardless of why they weren't able to do it, and I, I, I sense uh, Commissioner Valencia's frustration that uh, they seem so close when they appear before this commission, I know their council are extremely competent, capable people and who strive for settlement rather than uh, for litigation and for further expense to their parties. So they weren't able to do it. I accept that. Uh, I went back over the case law. I read an opinion of county council that was submitted to us. <clears throat> and uh, I believe what it comes down to um, in, in very simple terms is how we interpret that easement. Um, there was an easement granted uh, by the King's predecessors to uh, the Scheller's predecessors. It's a very clear easement. It's not only for road access purposes, but also for a water well um, and, uh, and for uh, other purposes associated with ownership of the land, um, public utilities, and uh, so the parties themselves decided, uh, their predecessors decided how wide this easement should be. They, they expressly said uh, 75 feet wide. Now, does that mean that the, uh, that the owners of the property over which the easement passes can make no use of that land? No, it doesn't. It, it, the case law is clear. They can make reasonable use of the property so long as it doesn't interfere with the use of the easement. So what it comes down to in my mind is whether the continued maintenance of the barn in the easement is a reasonable use of the property uh, uh, interfering with the uh, enjoyment of the easement. And, and I draw a distinction, right or wrong, between permanent buildings and, um, and crop use. Uh, other agricultural uses that uh, that can be plowed up in a moment's notice. And I, I don't think the kings are precluded from continuing their agricultural use until such time as the easement holder needs that property uh, for access, uh, uh, water lines, water wells, uh, or utility purposes. But the barn is a different matter, and I don't think the county is in a position where it can permit that. Uh, so the simple decision presented to the Planning Commission is just one step along the way, and that is um, do we recognize the ability of our staff to grant a, 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 a permit to continue using a barn, or do we have to recognize the rights the parties themselves agreed to many years ago for the, um, the existence of this 75-foot easement? And my conclusion is, as it was before, that uh, uh, despite any sympathies I might personally feel, uh, I have to recognize that uh, the Shellers have the right to the easement and to ask the uh, neighbors to move the barn. And uh, as I recall, along with the rest of you, there was even an offer to help uh, with the financial cost of moving the barn. But... Uh, that's for them to decide. I hope they can do it. I hope they don't take this matter to court because the uh, legal expense of doing so will go on for a long time. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess, first of all, I want to say how difficult this, this is for me, and I know how difficult it is for both the applicant and the appellant um, when you our neighbors and you have such disagreements where it's difficult to resolve it just makes life very difficult and it's always on your mind and it's constant and it's it's just not a very pleasant um, situation and I, I'm persuaded by um, what was presented back in our January meeting 
and the discussion um, that we had then. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm going to be fairly consistent, and I'm still, my vote would be to deny the appeal. So I don't really have anything more to add other than what um, others Th have added. Thank you. Uh, for myself, and I won't be nearly as long-winded as Commissioner Cooney was, but uh, I agree with most of his comments. The, the problem for me, and I asked this question at the last hearing, was would the county uh, approve a permit knowing that the structure that's being built is going to be built across an access easement that is on a recorded track map? And I'm pretty certain the answer is no. I know of no case where that's been done in the past, and I can't imagine it having doing it. I'm not persuaded by the arguments that this easement has been modified. This is not the, what I would consider the typical private easement um, between two parties that could be modified by the way it's used. This is an easement that appears on a track map, a recorded document. Now, I agree that when the county conditioned this track map, um, they didn't necessarily require in the conditions that it be as large as it be, but, they, but apparently the two owners agreed that it was going to be that large for the purpose that's stated there. And I don't think it's appropriate for us to modify <laughs> or, or a track map. I don't think you can do that. So I'm going to um, vote in favor of the appeal. Uh, and if they should determine later on or the court determines that the easement was not appropriate, let them modify it. But I don't see how you can modify the easement without amending the track map. This track map is something that the next purchaser is going to rely upon when they pull up their title reports. And I can't see us uh, permitting a, a barn that's across an existing recorded easement. So, Commissioner uh, Valencia, I believe this is in your district. Thank so. you, Mr. Chair. And with that, Mr. Chair, thank you for all the comments by all the commissioners. I know it's been hard for, I'm sure, the appellant and the and the people uh, asking for the denial. And uh, but it's something that you know sometimes it's better if they work out these things better than having government do it for them. Probably the next step, as you indicated, will be civil action. But with that, I move that we adopt the findings as revised in this memo dated March 27th, 2009, and that we accept the exemption included as attachment B pursuant to CEQA section 15303, new conversions or construction of small businesses and structures, and that we approve the appeal 08 APL 0 string 10, thereby denying the Planning and Development Department's approval of the land use permit number Permit number 08 LUP 0 string 24 and changes that have occurred during this process. To I'll second those. that motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And now we'll just, I just have one question for um, the commission. I, I'm, for me, the issue of the, cro the creek erosion was not a finding I needed to make. For me, the finding was that. It simply was a condition of the recorded track map, and I don't think we would allow a uh, structure to be built on that. Do, you, do the maker of the motion, the second holder, have any concerns about the e creek, creek issue? Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Commissioner Cooney. Uh, you know, when I went on the site visit and I looked at that, uh, and I, I saw the erosion on both sides, uh, later at the meeting, we had an engineer that came in or somebody that said it was a geologist and said, there isn't a problem, but I did see a problem. I just did see where there was erosion, considerable erosion, and there had been a lot of work done on the creek. But at, at that particular point, I didn't see that as being germane to this problem. Although it was associated with it, it just was a separate issue, uh, it's something that could probably be tackled on later on. But in this particular matter, it just, uh, I felt we could move on with it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Cooney. Well, Mr. Chair, I don't think the finding is essential to uh, my decision. However, I do think it supports the decision. So I'm in favor of adopting it. Great. Thank you. I see no other lights. So I think we're ready for the question. Ms. Op uh, Mr. Oh, excuse me, Ms. Black. Mr. Chair, I think um, something was lost in the translation when we forwarded this memo to you. Because your commission is going to be upholding the appeal and denying the project, I believe we've cited the wrong section of CEQA, and we should be citing 1527. No, it's not that one. The section of CEQA that says you don't have to comply with CEQA when you're denying a project. 
So Okay, we're going to take a, a five-minute break while they we'll look it up that. and figure it out. And Sorry. we'll also get set up for the next item. And we'll make the vote when we come back. Thank you. Ms. Black, do we have the modified uh, agreement? Thank you. Mr. Chair, so I think the motion should be amended to um, for n number two, which is regarding the um, exemption from CEQA to read the um, find the action exempt from CEQA pursuant to section uh, 15270 of CEQA. And I assume the maker and the second agree to the modification? Yes. Yes. Thank you. No, be no further discussion, Ms. Hoppen, if you'll read the roll call. Commissioner Cooney? Yes. Commissioner Brown? No. Commissioner Brooks? No. Commissioner Valencia? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Blau? Aye. Vote carries three to two. Thank you very much. So, Ms. Hoppen, if you'll read the next item into the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The following is the hearing on the request of Jason Rojas and John Polanski, agents for the Housing Authority of the County of Santa Barbara, to consider the following. A08 GPA3, application filed on March 19, 2008. B08 DVP11, application filed on March 19, 2008. C08 GOV24, application filed on March 19, 2008. D 08RDN5, application filed on March 19, 2008, and to approve the revised mitigated ne negative declaration 08NGD30, pursuant to the state guidelines for implementation of CEQA. Thank you. And now, Alex, for ex parte and site visits. Mr. Chair, I'm very familiar with the property. I've been there several times and uh, visited in the past. Commissioner Brown. I don't have anything further to report other than my uh, first visit and uh, meeting with Mr. Goldstein. Commissioner Brooks. Uh, yes, I have had no further uh, visitation or discussion since it was brought before us previously. Seeing no more, I'm also familiar with the site drive by quite often. Uh, so do we have a staff report, Ms. Black? Mr. Chair, Mr. Mc or Mrs. McCurdy will be providing that. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. McCurdy. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. This hearing is a continuance of the Housing Authority's proposal for affordable housing known as Creekside Village Apartments. And to refresh all of our memories, the project is located in the township of Los Alamos on the north side of San Antonio Creek. The project site has been designated as an affordable housing site since 1994. And this designation is carried forward in the proposed Los Alamos Community Plan update. The project is a proposal for 39 apartment units, all of which would be rented at rates affordable to low and very low income households. Priority would be given to local families who have a member employed in the agricultural sector. There are four requested permits, the development plan, a general plan text amendment, a government code consistency determination, and a road naming to rename Conway as Gonzales Drive. In response to concerns expressed at the February 11th Planning Commission hearing, the applicant has made some revisions to this plan. All of these are reflected on the revised site plan, which is shown on the slide. There are color copies that were distributed to the commissioners this morning. And just to review some of those changes, Building 5, which is located here, was moved to the north, um, closer to the road and further from the creek. And that allowed the tot lot to be moved north also out of the creek setback. There were parking spaces added in front of Building 7 at the request of the commission. And the cul-de-sac was redesigned to create a full diameter turnaround, resulting in some minor changes to right of way and the required government code determination. Also, building one was shifted slightly to fully comply with setbacks, and the gravel path, which is uh, shown along here, was also moved closer to the development area. 
The most current site plan and grading plan are dated March 19th and were submitted to the county on March 23rd. The mitigated ND was revised and was circulated for 30 days. The county received no comments on the revised document. The final MND is provided as attachment B. In terms of the revisions to the ND, the first revision addresses the discovery of a raptor nest adjacent to the site. This raptor nest was originally thought to be uh, golden eagles, but in fact was determined by a qualified biologist to be red-tailed hawks. Impacts will be mitigated by the standard raptor nest avoidance mitigation measure. The revised ND also includes more information regarding the number of potential students from the project and the status of the affected schools with respect to overcrowding. The additional information supports the conclusion that the project's effects on schools will not be significant. Both, I contacted the administration at both schools and they are both experiencing declining enrollment and the uh, superintendent at the elementary school said that in fact additional students would be financially beneficial for their, for their school. The ND also incorporates higher traffic generation factors for rural homes and the larger units. Those were discussed by, at, at the prior hearing by one of the engineers. This additional information does not alter the determination that the project's effects on, significant, project's effects on traffic would be below the threshold of significance. In terms of traffic safety, the ND was revised to address the impacts of trucks hauling fill to the site. A mitigation measure has been added to ensure that this traffic does not ensure, does not affect students walking to and from school. The project now includes a proposed condition of approval requiring a haul permit which would prohibit fill trucks arriving at or leaving the site during specified hours. Regarding aesthetics, the revised ND includes additional information regarding the visibility of the site from Highway 101. The visual resource section also was revised to require the project to comply with stricter night lighting standards comparable to the proposed outdoor lighting regulations for the Los Alamos Community Plan Area. Finally, the recent study by MNS engineers with respect to flooding, which again was addressed at the prior hearing, has been incorporated into the ND and addresses how Flood, the project would affect floodwaters in the vicinity of the site. Here's a little bit of information about the revisions to the right-of-way. Again, it results from the redesign of the cul-de-sac to provide the full turnaround. The revisions, um, the right-of-way changes now would be a vacation of an excess 10-foot strip of right-of-way along St. Joseph Street, the vacation of an excess 15-foot strip along Conway, and the acquisition of approximately 63 square feet of right-of-way from the applicant. These three revisions are consistent with the county's general plan in accordance with government code section 65402A. In terms of revisions to the project conditions, I've described a few already. The ones from the mitigated negative declaration include raptor nest avoidance and limits for haul trucks. The drainage conditions have been revised to reflect project clean water requirements and the approved drainage plans. Also, the revision to the fire department condition makes it clear that both fire department letters are applicable. It had, I had inadvertently um, replaced the first one with a second, but there are portions of the original letter that still apply. In terms of findings, following input from County Council and the Office of Long Range Planning, the finding regarding the processing of a general plan amendment in light of the board's resolution 08-328 has been revised, and the full text of this proposed finding is included in attachment A. Also, pursuant to staff's memo dated April 6th to the commission, additional findings have been made to one of the CEQA findings and to the final development plan findings. In terms of the attachments that are uh, part of the record, we have attachment A, the proposed findings, attachment B, the revised final MND, attachment C, the proposed conditions, attachment D, the proposed PC resolution regarding the general plan amendment, and attachment E is the revised site plan dated March 23rd. 
To summarize the issues, the project would provide 39 affordable rental units. All the project's impacts would be mitigated to less than significance. With the proposed text amendment to the Los Alamos Community Plan, the project will be consistent with a comprehensive plan. The project is consistent with the proposed Los Alamos Community Plan update, and it is consistent with the Land Use Development Code. Therefore, staff recommends that the Planning Commission, number one, recommend that the board adopt the required findings, two, recommend that the board approve the mitigated ND and adopt the mitigation monitoring program, three, adopt a resolution, attachment D, recommending that the board adopt the general plan amendment to revise development standard flood Los Alamos 1.1.5 of the Los Alamos community plan. Four, determine that changes to the right-of-way are consistent with the county's general plan pursuant to government code section 65402A. And five, recommend that the board approve the project subject to the conditions included as attachment C. That concludes staff's presentation. I'd be happy to address any questions that you may have about the project or the revisions. Thank you. Any, any questions of staff from the commission? See, uh, Commissioner Cooney. <coughs> Yes, I, I do have just a couple, um, Mr. Chair, with respect to um, the 63 um, square feet of additional property. Where is that? Uh, this, this would be uh, land dedicated by the developer to the county? Yes, and it would be in the bulb of the cul-de-sac, I believe, but I can go back to a slide here. And we also have uh, Harrison Heil from Real Property. I know he's standing by in Santa Barbara if, there, if you want more information. Let's see. I believe it's in this area where you can see now, that if you recall, they didn't show a full turnaround before, and now they're showing the full turnaround, showing that this portion right in here that is the applicant's property would become part of the right-of-way. All right, thank you. Um, second question concerns the um, hall permit. Um, I I, first of all, uh, Ms. McCurdy, I appreciate very much the way uh, staff has addressed all of the commission's concerns that I had noted. And, um, and one of the concerns about which I uh, had particular concern was uh, making sure that the very considerable amount of uh, additional fill being hauled to the site to raise the level um, was not going to um, interfere with the uh, normal passage of the um, neighbors and particularly school children. So you've indicated to secure that uh, notion in part, um, the applicant has to acquire a hall permit from public works. And uh, I, I'm not aware of that. I'm, I'm sure we've had it in other conditions, but I, I've never focused on it. So that's a separate permit that um, the applicant has to acquire with respect to that particular part of the project. That's correct. <clears throat> okay, and then um, in the project description, there's discussion of a uh, full-time manager residing on the site um, as well as uh, maintenance staff employed on the site. Um, I didn't see a condition uh, particularly addressing that, but um, if the applicant were to decide for economic or other reasons that uh, it's not possible to maintain a manager on site, uh, would it require a modification uh, to the project conditions? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Cooney, yes, it would, because the project description is picked up as, I believe, the first condition. Mr. Cooney, if I could, I think an apartment project of this size that you're required to have an on-site manager by state law. Maybe Ms. Van Bowen could weigh in on that issue. Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Cooney, I don't know that off the top of my head, but I'd be happy to check if you'd like me to. 
Well, I think it's a very important uh, aspect of the project. Um, it makes a big difference in terms of such uh, concerns that the neighbors have expressed, uh, noise emanating from the project, uh, cleanliness, all of these kinds of things. Um, I, I'm happy with Ms. McCurdy's explanation that it is part of the project conditions, whether it's required or not by state law. So. Um, I, I just want to be sure that everybody understands, including the applicant, that it is, in fact, a requirement and that if for any reason uh, there's a desire to cut back on that, um, on that position or uh, having the person there on site full time, it would require a, another um, review before this commission. Commissioner Valencia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and uh, Ms. McCurdy, I also would like to compliment you on the uh, uh, the applicant for putting these parking spaces, which we requested at the last meeting. And uh, what, what the question I have now is this area here that is left blank, uh, the road comes, this is a diminished size road here, and we understand that uh, for this entrance here. But this piece of property here that's just left blank, uh, what is, it's still part of the entire project. What is going to happen there? What is planned for there? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Valencia, I don't believe there's any development proposed there, but we could ask uh, Mr. <coughs> Goldstein <coughs> to clarify. For, perhaps when Mr. Goldstein comes up to, he could tell us, I don't understand, if nothing's planned for there, why this green area just couldn't be continued in there? I know it would cause more maintenance, but it'll probably cost as much maintenance to keep the weeds down if they don't do anything. But I'll have that question for him when he comes up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Seeing no other questions on that, I'd like to invite the applicant to come before us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Um, it is our pleasure to be back here in front of you for final action on this project. Um, I think last time we explain the process we'd been through and uh, for an affordable housing project that um, and I appreciate staff um, doing everything they've been able to do to push it forward. We've still been working on it for about eight years or so. Um, so I want to thank Alice very much for doing everything she has done to revise the staff report, the negative declaration, and be able to bring it back to you today. Um, this is the only affordable housing overlay site in North County and the only proposed project uh, with 100% affordable housing uh, to be located on it. So we're really happy that, um, that we've accomplished all we have at this point. The um, main issues that caused us to continue this, um, first of all, the uh, suggestions by the uh, Planning Commission or requests uh, that we make certain revisions to the site plan. Um, I just want to go over those again to make sure that uh, you're all satisfied that we fully responded to your request. So the uh, parking spaces in front of building, uh, I'm sorry, the parking spaces in, in front of the building um, to the west of the cul-de-sac, um, I don't have a pointer, but you all know where they are. Uh, so those have been relocated so that they're more uh, closely um, in proximity to that building. Uh, the cul-de-sac itself has been moved to the east, which in fact helped us from a grading perspective. Originally it was further to the west on a slight rise um, of the hillside. It's now on virtually flat ground. Um, so won't, well, thank you. I'm not either, I'm not, e not even gonna try. <laughs> I think this works. There we go. So originally this cul-de-sac was approximately here and um, has now been moved here as a full cul-de-sac. And in answer to uh, Commissioner Cooney's question, that right-of-way extends beyond the existing county road right-of-way, and that's the 63 square feet that we'll be dedicating to the county. This is a public road and Gonzales is a continuation of a public road. Um, we also, originally, um, we had requests for modification of setbacks. This building actually encroached into the front yard setback. Um, 
we have moved it slightly to the south to take it out of the setback area so now it fully conforms. There are no um, requests, no requirements for setback modifications on this project. We also relocated the walking path that's in the open space area, moving it further from the creek, further from the riparian zone. And I believe that was a, a request of uh, Commissioner uh, Brown, I believe. Um, the tot lot, as Alice pointed out, originally was located in the open space area. It's now beyond the 50 foot setback riparian zone. And that caused us to move this building number five slightly to the north to make room for that play area, recreation area. I believe those were um, the major revisions. Um, and of course, uh, we did have a uh, biologist consultant that um, did in fact find that what was thought to be um, golden eagles, uh, which everyone questioned originally, um, actually turned out to be a pair of red-tailed hawks. Uh, there's a question as to whether they're actually nesting in those trees or not, but uh, regardless, there's a condition now that uh, will require us to have that study prior to any construction commencing. Uh, the school impact um, actually turns out both high school and elementary schools are facing declining enrollment. Um, Ron Barba from the elementary school is actually looking forward to an increase in enrollment to help their financial situation. And then uh, lastly, with regard to parking, I think I indicated last time that we exceed the minimum required parking. Um, and the housing authority on other projects has actually designated parking spaces as well as restricted um, vehicle ownership um, for the tenants. And uh, they have an agreement that was drafted. They intend to carry forward with that uh, same provision on this project. All the conditions, the original conditions, as well as these revised conditions are all acceptable um, and we intend to fully comply. Uh, the hall permit is something that occasionally we have come across on other projects where we have a fairly large uh, volume of soil to either be exported or imported. And in this particular case, the reason we're doing that is to address the issue of um, uh, uh, truck traffic potentially interfering with school um, children walking to and from school. So not only are we required to have that haul permit, but we're also restricted in terms of the times that those uh, trucks can be on the road. And that is an acceptable condition. Um, the uh, issue with regard to an on-site manager and maintenance staff, that is something that the Housing Authority uh, traditionally has done, wants to do. Um, they um, see that as a, a integral part of their ability to maintain and control their project. So we understand that is a condition um, incorporated in the project description and it's something that they do intend to uh, comply with and carry forward with. So if at any time, and that was also in a response to some of the issues that were um, raised at the LAPAC meetings in the community. So if at any time in the future they decide they can't have an on-site manager, which is really not something that they foresee, but it would require modification to conditions on this project. Um, and then lastly, Commissioner Valencia's uh, question regarding that westerly end of the road. The uh, portion of the road that's shaded along here, cul-de-sac, and then this extension um, is indicating paving. So that's the area that will be paved. This area is um, remaining as part of the county road right-of-way. So what we will do in the final design, as you indicated, it's probably gonna be easier to maintain this if it were landscaped, um, but we need permission from the county road department, public works department, um, to incorporate that in the landscape area. That would be our intent. If, and I can't imagine uh, they would not allow us to do that, um, but the reason it's not colored is we don't have that specific permission yet, but that's clearly the, the intent. Um, that's really all I have to say. Um, 
as you recall last time, uh, the commission voiced their gener general support for the project, um, wanted these modifications made and brought back to you for your final decision. So thank you very much. Uh, John Polanski is here. He would like to address you as well. I'm sorry, were there any questions for me? Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. Uh, my name is John Polanski, Director of Housing Development, Housing Authority of the County of Santa Barbara. And I want to echo initially um, Sid's thanks to the staff and to the commission. We're back here um, pretty quickly when you consider that we had to do a revised mitigated NAG deck and um, the staff, Alice taking the lead, but, but the uh, entire planning staff, we really appreciate the focus and the attention that they gave this project so it would not undergo further delays. So we really do appreciate the work that you did on, on revising the staff report, incorporating the changes that the commission had requested, and on getting the mitigated <clears throat> they deck out. I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'm, I'm kind of at the last throes of a cold. Um, and just a couple of issues that are specific to the Housing Authority's commitments. <clears throat> uh, the first one is on the parking. Um, the first time that we ever encountered a specific lease parking restrictions were in the Santa Maria project to which I've referred before, uh, Ted Sanish Gardens. And we, so we already have a draft uh, that was approved by the city. We will work with staff to make sure that the draft uh, lease agreement that we intend to use at uh, Creekside is also going to be acceptable to the county. What we're proposing initially, and this will cover all of the um, resident spaces, would be the four bedroom units would get a maximum of three spaces. All of the three bedroom units would have a maximum of two spaces. Seven of the two bedroom units would have one space. The remaining 11 of the two bedroom units would have two spaces. And this, and this would be a maximum. Again, our experience is that uh, typically um, the affordable um, households with whom we work don't have more than one uh, or perhaps two at the very most vehicles. But it certainly does uh, satisfy some of the concerns that the commission had expressed and that the neighbors had, had expressed. The thing about this being part of the lease is it's a lease violation if we're to find that they have violated. Um, and so that gives us uh, much more teeth uh, to be able to enforce. It also provides the housing authority. I, I remember and really appreciated the comments of a couple of commissioners about the way that they've noticed we maintain our existing properties and the fact that we do tow cars that are not authorized or, or perhaps inoperable. And this does provide us with an even better opportunity to do that. We recognize uh, unauthorized vehicles uh, much quicker than we would have. Uh, the other thing regarding the full-time manager, uh, it is actually a, a matter of state law uh, with which we have to comply. 16 units and above uh, is the requirement that um, uh, projects have a full-time, it could be called caretaker, it could be called manager, um, their job function, but it is a, a full-time staffer who reports to the, to the housing authority uh, as owner in this particular case. Um, and we've performed uh, for this full-time individual as well as for the maintenance staff. And um, we always make sure that before we embark on a project, it at the very least breaks even from year one, and, and that is including the, the um, necessary maintenance staff and the management uh, person who will be living on the site. Uh, the last thing I, I just wanted to uh, cover was the, the committed funding and the upcoming funding. At our last meeting, I had mentioned to you that with the continuance, we might miss the first round of, of tax credits this year, and indeed that would have been the case if they had kept their normal schedule. But as it turns out, with the stimulus uh, funding and with some additional uh, changes to the tax credit rules, the first round for this year was delayed till May 26th. So we actually still uh, have, uh, are cautiously optimistic that we'll be able to, uh, 
to apply at least in the in the first round and and we'll see of course it's going to depend on uh, the central coast region and, and the competing projects but uh, we can still meet that time frame so again we really are appreciative of that very quick uh, turnaround work the other thing that we wanted to ensure was that the commission understood that we tried to be as responsive as we possibly could um, and actually, as is often the case, although some of us developers are hesitant uh, to admit it, uh, the Commission's comments made a better project. And we think in the end, between working with staff and with working with the members of the Commission, uh, this will be the best possible project. We look forward to moving forward with it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I know we can't charge for that, can we? <laughs> I hate that part. <laughs> oh, <it's> a... <laughs> I met the commission getting paid extra for that. Good work we did. Okay. I do have a uh, speaker slip from uh, Mickey Flax, I think, in Santa Barbara. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Mickey Flax. I live here in Santa Barbara, and I am the first district representative to the Board of Commissioners for the County Housing Authority. Um, as such, I'm fairly familiar with the project uh, since it began to be talked about. And uh, I am very familiar with the work of the Housing Authority. So I, um, I heard a speaker the other day, actually, the, the city manager of the city of Ventura, talking about how people are leery of living anywhere near uh, multifamily housing in general and specifically low-income housing, as he said, because they think, you know, those people have cooties. Um, and the further away you live from them, the less likely you are to catch them. Um, I want to assure you that our tenants certainly don't have cooties and that our uh, housing authority does a magnificent job of assuring maintenance, um, aesthetic considerations, uh, well managed, uh, good management, uh, anything else you can think of in terms of property management. I would venture to say that our county housing authority is among the best in the county. And uh, a visit to any of our properties, I think, will confirm that. So I want to thank the commission um, for its suggestions that, that probably do make it a better project, uh, and also to reassure the commission and the community that this, like most of our projects, will indeed be an asset uh, to the community, and, uh, and cooties are not in the picture. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe that's our last speaker. All right. In that case, I will close it to the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for questions and deliberations. Commissioner Brooks. Thank you, Chair Blau. Uh, this project is in the third uh, district. I am ready to make a motion, but um, I will make some comments probably first and then listen to uh, my colleagues. Uh, as I mentioned at, at the previous hearing for this project, um, I think it's it's a good project. I have full faith in the housing authority. Uh, they run a um, very tight ship, as I noticed over in the Lompoc Valley. Um, I think that the, there was some concern about some community input uh, with the, the law pack. I think that's being reformed. But I think on a whole that the community right now over in Los Alamos is um, uh, supporting this. I did receive one letter. I think perhaps we all um, got, and I just want to acknowledge I received a letter from Jean Naughton, and I know that she has worked on uh, the law pack, and I, I did take into consideration some of her comments. But um, I am ready to uh, support the project as is. It also uh, motivated me to look more closely at the Los Alamos uh, community plan. And I envy the people who will be living in this project because they're going to be walking to a, a very, hopefully, a very beautiful and very vibrant downtown. And it's so pedestrian, and I certainly like to see that, that um, the people living in this particular project will be um, you know, embracing and be embraced by the community because they can walk and you know, do all their shopping and just their living out there And as this uh, Bell Street is developed, uh, it should uh, be all inclusive, which I liked. I like the idea of that also. Uh, on site management, I think will be um, solve any potential problems. And I, you know, as I said, as Ms. Flax said, I think um, the, the community is there already. You have the people living in the community that will just be moving into 
better housing. And that was something that I mentioned previously. I hope um, as those units are, those substandard units are being vacated, that zoning, somebody take a very close look at uh, some of the substandard housing that exists and hopefully nobody else will have to move into the substandard housing. So those are my comments and I'm ready to make a motion uh, whenever. Thank you. May I suggest you go ahead and make the motion. We'll find a second and we'll ask for any discussion. If we don't have any, we think we can take a vote on it. Okay, thank you, Chair. And staff might help me along on this. I'm just reading it from um, the recommendation uh, that I will move that we recommend that the Board of Supervisors adopt the required findings for the project specified in attachment A of the report, including the CEQA findings. Uh, number two, that we recommend the Board of Supervisors approved, and should that be the revised mitigated negative declaration? Uh, number eight, uh, zeros 30 as included in attachment B and adopt the mitigation monitoring program contained in the conditions of approval. Uh, the motion will recommend that the Planning Commission adopt the resolution in attachment D recommending that the Board of Supervisors adopt a general plan amendment to revise the development standard flood Los Alamos 1.1.5 of the Los Alamos Community Plan as follows. Do I need to read all that? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, that uh, we determined that the vacation of the excess 10-foot strip of the county right-of-way along St. Joseph and the excess 15-foot strip of county right-of-way along Conway by the county and the county's acquisition of the approximately 63 square feet of right-of-way from the applicant, they are consistent with the county's general plan. In accordance with the government code 65402A, and finally, that we recommend that the Board of Supervisors approve the project subject to the conditions, conditions included as attachment C. Second. Thank you. Ms. Black, you have some comments. M Mr. Chair, just as to the um, motion, that's essentially the motion that's included on page three right. of the March 27th, 2009 staff memorandum, and I would just note one um, change to that, and that would be in finding number one, that you recommend that the Board of Supervisors adopt the required findings for the project specified in attachment A of the memo dated 4-6-2009, because that revised those findings. Other than that, the motion would stand as... Agreed. Thank you, and the second okay. holder agrees. Yes, great. Uh, and now we'll go for further discussion on the motion. Commissioner Cooney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to express a mild <coughs> concern with the general plan amendment we're recommending to the board. Um, we are taking a specific standard um, with respect to flood-prone property, and we're substituting a general standard. That is, it must comply with the requirements of the flood control. And uh, I usually... <coughs> um, don't raise this concern on behalf of developers, but if I were a developer, I'd be a little concerned that that could be arbitrary, um, whatever the conditions that might be applied. Uh, the remedy uh, is really to uh, uh, appeal to the deciding body, I suppose. Um, the way it is now, while we have a general plan condition that's specific, um, we do have county departments, fire departments, uh, flood control, highways. Everybody makes comments and adds conditions that are specific to a project. I assume that will still happen, that there will be specific standards applied project by project. But our general plan standard is now going to be very general. And, uh, I, you know, it just wasn't lost on me. I think it shouldn't be lost on the commission that... Um, we are broadening considerably the discretion of the flood control um, uh, staff. Uh, just to make a small comment, having been there and done that, that's always been the case. Flood control is not fun to work with, but they're, but they, you know, they usually prevent floods from occurring. So I don't think this makes it any worse or any better. There's just the way flood control is. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner Valencia. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Commissioner Brown. Oh, thank you. Um, I want to thank the applicant and staff for really working on the project, and I appreciate uh, the county housing authority going to working with the commission uh, and making those small changes. Um, it's been my experience in working with Mr. Polanski and 
um, and his staff that they really are concerned about the details of the project and the details often make the a very nice project those that the, the couple projects that I know that are in the Glead area are really very nice, and I suspect that this one will be um, a complement to the community, and um, I know Mr. Goldstein and his brother have worked hard to come up with a, a very nice architectural design and uh, site planning. So I'm, I'm fully supportive of this project. I, I think it's great. It's a nice addition to the community, and I'm ready to vote. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Valencia. Yes, Mr. Chair, I did have one, one, just the renaming of the road from Conway to Gonzales Way. Could you tell somebody tell us who Mr. Gonzalez was or what? Does anybody have any idea? I'll invite Mr. Goldstein back even though the paper is closed Chair. for that question. I don't know who he is, but the reason uh, the road name is being changed is Gonzales Drive is already named to the east. And this is simply an extension of that same road. So it's not to confuse it's the actually fire, at not, the, not to confuse the fire department EMTs. Exactly. Good reason. It was actually at the request of the fire department. Great. Uh, for myself, I'm fully supportive of the project. I uh, appreciate Mr. Goldstein's comments regarding the uh, fact that they found the commission helpful. That's uh, nice. Nice to hear occasionally. I don't hear that too often. So having said that, I believe we're ready for the vote. Ms. Hutt, Ms. Oplin. Commissioner Cooney? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Brooks? Aye. Commissioner Valencia? Aye. Commissioner Blau? Aye. Vote carries 5-0. Thank you. I think we'll take a little five-minute break and set up for our last item. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to go back on the record for our last item for the day, which is... Well, I'll let Ms. Oplin read it to the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the following is the hearing on the request of the Planning and Development Department that the County Planning Commission consider and adopt a recommendation to the Board of Supervisors that they adopt an Ordinance 09-ORD-1 amending Section 35-1 the County Land Use and Development Code of Chapter 35 Zoning of the County Code that would revise the existing procedures for permitting solar energy systems to be consistent with uh, with the California Government Code Section 65850.5. Thank you, uh, Ms. Black. We have a staff report. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Langle will be presenting this today. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the County Planning Commission. Um, most of you remember that we were before you in October of last year with a workshop regarding uh, potential revised permit process to allow for freestanding um, solar energy systems to shift that permit requirement from a land use permit that's currently required to a zoning clearance provided that particular system met a set of development standards that were designed to address neighborhood compatibility issues. In February of this year we presented a similar proposal to the Montecito Planning Commission who did adopt the uh, proposed, or recommend to the Board of Supervisors, rather, that they adopt a proposed ordinance that would institute uh, a similar scheme for the Montecito planning area. Um, to, um, also, for a bit of review, so I can change this thing. Sorry. There we go. You may remember that Government Code Section 65850.5 that we discussed at the workshop, um, which was adopted in September of 2004, this amended the Government Code regarding solar energy systems. And the purpose of this bill was to promote the use of solar energy and to make it easier to install solar energy systems. Subsequent to the February hearing on by the Montecito Planning Commission, the County Council's office based on or in response to certain questions that were directed to them, reviewed the legislative history of Assembly Bill 2473 and came to the conclusion that the proposed permit scheme that the Montecito Planning Commission just recommended for adoption uh, did not fully comply with Government Code Section 65850.5 as this section imposes strict limitations on the ability of local government to regulate solar energy systems. 
In summary, um, and I'll go th through these briefly, uh, this section provides that a city or county shall administratively approve applications to install, sol install solar energy systems through the issuance of a building permit or a similar non-discretionary permit. And that the review of such an application is limited to the building officials review of whether it meets all the health and safety requirements of s local state and federal law. This uh, section also limits the requirements of local law to those standards and regulations that are necessary to ensure that a solar energy system does not have a specific adverse impact upon the public health and safety. However, the, the uh, government code section does provide that if the building official feels or has a good faith belief that the solar energy system could have a specific adverse impact on public health and safety, then he may require that a use permit be applied for. However, just, just, a, just a quick question. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think of an example where that could occur, <laughs> and I'm having a difficult time thinking of one. Can you help me with that? Where th there might be a impact of public health and safety. I was thinking about this too, and in one situation I was able to come up with was that the location of the solar panels um, and the reflection angles created a glare that could impact traffic safety, for example. In that case, the building official would it be able to either require the use permit or through negotiations with the applicant, uh, relocate the system so it wouldn't have that potential impact of traffic safety. Okay. Well, it seems to me the building official would have the ability to make a determination that that location was was a health and safety issue. I'm just sure not how a use permit gets gets around that. So just uh, anyway, it was just a kind of a question, mm -hmm. Commissioner Brown. Well, you know, I had the the same question. Um, is there are there some sort of standards by which you would judge whether or not it adversely impacts? I mean, I, I, I'm kind of at a loss to know. Does he just get up there and go, okay, well, it looks okay, or maybe I think I mean, how what? There's got to be some concrete measurements that are being used to address this. The government code is not very uh, comprehensive in talking about what those um, standards would be, except that it's based on existing regulations dealing with protection of public health and safety. So it would be our, on a local level, our, level, our own building code, our plumbing code, our electrical code and that the building official would use primarily to determine if there was a, a potential or an adverse impact. Other than that, they would just be looking at the system as location and making a judgment as to whether or not, you know, there could be the potential to have an adverse impact. But there would never be, let's use the one for traffic, for instance, for the glare. No studies are being done that would show that with somebody applying to install a solar system, that would provide that kind of information. So for the building official to make this judgment independently it would not be possible. You know, I, I don't see the connection, how you would, how the building official would have the information to make that determination. Because building, because there'd be no requirement for the applicant to submit any sort of documentation about something like that. So it would just be, well, I think there might be some glare, therefore you need a use permit. It's pretty murky here. Mr. Chair and uh, Commissioner Brown, there there actually are some uh, standard software packages that are okay. computer applications you can use that if you feel that there is the potential that if the location of the solar energy system is near a road, you can actually figure out what the solar angle is going to be. And in that instance, you know, and it would just take the building official saying, you know, this thing is close to the road, based on the location of it and its angle, you know, I feel that there could be a reflection problem and then require the, the use permit, which could then okay. evaluate whether or not that problem actually exists or not. Okay. Now, last time we uh, also got a picture from somebody's property of glare from an installed solar system. Is that um, a impact on someone else's property has no effect? I think Ms. Ben Mullen wants to weigh in. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair and Commissioner Brown, we actually looked at that particular issue and concluded that under 
this state law provision, that would not be a health and safety issue. So it's really um, has to affect a public, you know, a roadway or create some other safety issue. Ms. Van Mullen. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Brown, I'll just add that the government code section, the way it's very broad on this issue, but the way that it, it talks about the building officials review of whether it meets health and safety requirements of local, state, and federal law. And then section F, and the government code section, we attached it so that it would give you an idea of the parameters of our ability to regulate this, but in section F, it defines some of those standards so that um, the solar energy system shall meet applicable health and safety standards imposed by state and local permitting authorities. And then section two talks about the solar energy system for heating water shall be certified. So it gives a, a little bit of the parameters that the building official is looking at. M Mr. Chair, I think um, what you're hearing is the presumption is that these are not going to create a health and safety issue. It's sort of an affirmative action of the building and safety officials. So the, the law is definitely siding on siding these facilities and allowing them to occur in a ministerial fashion. Thank you. Please continue. I'm sorry, Commissioner Cooney. Uh, just on this point, Mr. Chair, I <clears throat> the other instance in which I thought this might apply, and, and it assumes that by requiring a use permit, uh, there is some means of mitigating the health and safety effect and, and that the county could require that is in connection with uh, um, areas surrounding um, airports uh, in the county because um, I know that uh, reflections off of uh, buildings in particular are a concern of airport authorities. And uh, all this would do is uh, give the building official the ability due to the location and potential for uh, a health or safety um, uh, impact of the installation to indicate that uh, you know I'm going to I'm going to require a review of these issues so that if there is an issue we can uh, mitigate it and not to eliminate the the solar system but just to have a, a series of review and uh, I think by attempting to occupy the field the state is telling us that we don't want you to, um, you as a county or as a city, to apply the usual aesthetic concerns that a community has about the way they look. But if you can show that there is an issue of public safety, then of course we want you to look into and, and okay. concern yourself with that. So even though the instances would be few and far between, um, I, I think it's appropriate to include it in the uh, ordinance and we're about to get to the coastal zone, which has a different set of rules. Great. Uh, I guess my only comment would be that, <clears throat> sure, if I were a public employee or in the building department, I would love for senior staff to come up with those possible conditions that would require a use permit and publish those so that, you know, we're not operating in the dark. And I would hate to have a situation where there was a good reason to go through the use permit process, but the staff person that, that's providing discretionary commit has no guidance as to when that should occur. So I would just make that comment. So please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Seguing from uh, Mr. Cooney's comment regarding the ability to, to require use permit, the government code then says, well, you can require such a permit, but you can't deny it unless, and it makes stri pretty stringent um, circumstance that in order to deny the application for the use permit, the building official would have to make findings based on substantial evidence in the record that the installation would have a specific adverse impact on public health and safety and that there is really no feasible method to uh, alleviate that situation. Mr. Lingle, excuse me, before you run off on that, what, what would that look like? What form would that look like? What would the building official do? Is would it be a standardized forum that would be prepared or that they'd have to come up with their own? Can you walk me through that of what that might be? Well, that's what I was asking them to come I, up with. I, I understand I don't that. think it's there yet. No, okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair and, and Commissioner Brown, that's something we're going to have to come up with okay. is a form, an application okay. for a solar use permit. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it's possible within that application 
to then provide guidance to the building official as to which systems okay. may raise the specter of adverse impact by, you know, how close are you to an airport, for example, what's the distance for, for the nearest uh, street, things like that. And how will that, who, who will develop that? Who, what, what are the internal processes? Oh, Mr. Langle. Okay, good, fine. It's good hands in. Thank you. Okay, uh, continuing on. Uh, in regards to the use permit, both the decision to require a use permit by the building official and the uh, decision of the building official on the use permit may be appealed to the Planning Commission. So some of these may float up to you, but again, given the, the uh, standards by which you would have to um, first require a use permit and then deny one, it's... I don't think you'll see many of these coming your way. And Mr. Chair, if I may, how, what would be the noticing for the use permit? Uh, the noticing, the, the system that we've proposed that's included in the ordinance that's in front of you today, is similar to a land use permit okay. for systems within the inland area so that, um, and under the proposed noticing changes that you'll be seeing um, fairly soon, um, beginning of May, I believe, uh, all neighbors, all property owners within uh, 300 feet would receive mailed notice, and there would be posted notice as well. Okay, and the issue that we addressed last time with the two frontages would be, okay. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Yeah, essentially, it relies on the noticing required for the land use permit, and that addresses those things that were discussed at the recent workshop. Um, lastly, any conditions imposed on the application by the building official are restricted to those that are designed to mitigate the specific adverse impact at the lowest cost possible. So under the current process that's existing today, roof-mounted solar energy systems are exempt from zoning permits, they're exempt from design review, they do require uh, building permits and electrical permits, and if it actually is a thermal system, utilize, utilizing hot water, a plumbing permit as well. Uh, again, existing regulations for freestanding systems requires a coastal development permit if it's in the coastal zone or a land use permit if it's in the inland area. Again, they're exempt from design review because 65850.5 specifically says that these are not subject to design review at the local level. And also freestanding systems currently would require the building permit and electrical permit. Under the proposed process, uh, and first let's discuss the coastal zone. The government code section appears to be uh, somewhat in conflict with the Coastal Act, and that's not too surprising with some of these things that are uh, written in, in the government code that have ramifications on applications that also must follow the public resources code, such as uh, development within the coastal zone. So since the Coastal Act requires a coastal development permit for all development occurs in the coastal zone, to maintain consistency with this requirement, the proposed ordinance retains the requirement to obtain a CDP. However, in order to comply with the directive in Section 65850.5 that solar energy systems be approved via a non-discretionary permit, the ordinance uh, creates a special process for so, so, <laughs> sorry, solar energy systems that would normally require a, per a public hearing because of their location either within a jurisdictional area of the, uh, the appeals area of the coastal zone or uh, similar uh, situations that would require that that permit be an appealable permit. So the proposed ordinance includes a, uh, a special project process for such systems that's very similar to what we've set up in concert with the Coastal Commission for residential second units that also enjoy protection under the government code of not being allowed to have a discretionary hearing yet in order to um, make them not be in conflict with the Coastal Act, we provide that the um, uh, CDPs for a solar energy system that would normally require a public hearing would not require a public hearing, but it would receive the same notice, and we would maintain that these systems would still be appealable to the Coastal Commission. So I have a question. Um, often we see neighbors filing appeals to delay, frustrate, and is there any provision where 
the appellate would have to demonstrate that this is a health and safety issue because I can see them appealing it and coming up and spending an hour talking about the aesthetics of it and the ugliness of it and so forth and and that the Coastal Commission or any other commission has the right to make a finding that it's ugly. We haven't included that because the, we feel that because it's in the coastal zone and the Coastal Act requires a coastal development for all development in the coastal zone and also requires that those coastal development permits have to be found to be consistent with the Coastal Act and all the resource protection policies in that in that act. So we have not at this point uh, limited the ability to appeal um, or the, the grounds on which an appeal of a solar energy system can be can be submitted. We tried to do something similar again using residential second units um, because again of the government code provisions for or protections of residential second units and the Coastal Commission when they uh, certified that particular amendment they took out the restrictions on the ability on the grounds on which you could appeal and put it back to being again consistency with the Coastal Act so we've been down that path once before we weren't successful and we can try it again but I, I don't think we'll be successful Right. Moving on to the inland area. Again, the existing exemption for roof-mounted solar energy systems would be maintained, but under the proposed ordinance, we would now exempt freestanding systems from zoning permits. In other words, we'd shift from requiring a land use permit, which is the existing requirement, to making them exempt from zoning permits entirely. Building electrical and plumbing permits would still be required, and those permits um, could be appealed, but those would go to the Board of Building Appeals, and again, the appeals on those would be based on whether or not the system was somehow inconsistent with the building electrical and plumbing code. So the, the, uh, the grounds on which you can appeal those permits are, is fairly restrictive. The proposed ordinance also does create a new solar use permit process, and as was mentioned, we are going to have to create a special application for that. Uh, and also, as previously, previously discussed, this solar use permit can only be required when the building official has a good faith belief that the system could have a specific adverse impact upon the public health and safety. Again, this decision could be appealed to the Planning Commission and then to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, assuming it wasn't ap appealed or that the decision to require the permit was upheld, the billing official would then either approve or deny the solar use permit. And again, as was previously mentioned, that decision would be noticed, the same as the land use permit would be. Again, the decision to deny requires the adoption of findings and that any conditions imposed on that permit are restricted to those necessary to mitigate health and safety impacts. And in this situation, we are proposing that the appeals be restricted to a demonstration that the system would not have any health and safety impacts. you back up one? That didn't make sense to me for, for I'm a sorry. second. <laughs> so if the um, building official were to deny a solar use permit, then an appeal of that decision would be by the applicant, basically, and they would have to demonstrate that the system would not have any health and safety impacts to be successful in, in that appeal. Or, or couldn't be mitigated, so, okay. Uh, Mr. Right. Chair, um, Mr. Cody. while we're on this subject, and this is slightly uh, tangent to it, but um, <clears throat> I see a situation um, where, uh, which might occur, um, and it, it has nothing to do with health and safety, but as I understand it, the uh, building official um, before uh, the ministerial permit could be issued would have to be satisfied that the installation was in compliance with all of the other um, 
regulations of the county regarding setbacks, for example, or height or, uh, you know, other issues. And if an applicant wanted to um, have a sufficiently large installation that it, it intruded into one of the setbacks, their remedy would be to seek a variance or modification under the usual processes? Mr. Chair and Commissioner Cooney, yes, that would still be available to any applicant if what they're proposing did not fit with the existing zoning requirements for setback and heights. Well, I see the process potentially as being the applicant comes in, um, they have to provide uh, some kind of information to the building official as to where the installation is going to be as opposed to just something the manufacturer has produced as to the makeup of the panels themselves. And uh, so that presumes some kind of plot plan would be put in. And at that point, um, the, we're relying on the building department to look at the location and determine whether it meets all the setback requirements. Mr. Chair and Commissioner Cooney, the building division, when they receive a, a building permit application, uh, routinely has that reviewed by the, uh, the planners to make sure that it does comply, comply with the zoning standards. The planners, you mean the, the, um, the planning well, and development? The planning department? and development, yes. The building division of planning and development does have those plans reviewed by the planning, the planning side of the, of the department, so to speak. Within the building and safety division in South County, the whole zoning and permit, permit counter is staffed by building and safety personnel, including dedicated planners to that counter. So it's not just the building personnel you know, trying to view this according to the land use development code, an actual designated planner will be looking at those at permit applications. Ms. Black. M Mr. Chair, just for a, a little bit of clarification, the planner actually stamps a project exempt. So they've reviewed it, they've indicated they've reviewed it, and when they stamp it exempt, they are in, in essence saying it complies with the setbacks and height and other provisions of the zoning ordinance. Because that's still a requirement even if a, an uh, project is exempt from the ordinance. Commissioner Valencia has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, and I have a, a question. Suppose a, a neighbor has, a, say, a quarter acre lot, has a nice big house on there, has a swimming pool, a spa, and all that, and he gets carried away with wanting to put a lot of square footage in terms of solar panels to heat the pool, heat the spa continually, and all these things. Is there a square footage allowable matrix that would say, based on the square footage of your lot, this is a square footage that you can have? Mission Chair and Commissioner Valencia, <clears throat> there, there is no such relationship. Can you see the problem that could get, give somebody, uh, if there isn't a square footage? I think what they're telling us, Mr. Valencia, is it's not allowed by state law. We can't regulate it. Mm -hmm. My God. <laughs> Okay, Here's the a here come the problems. In a nutshell, yes, that's, that's the situation. Um, lastly, the creation of the new solar use permit process will require revisions to Chapter 10 of the County Code, which is the building regulations. Uh, these revisions would be required in order to address the solar use permit process. Uh, these revisions will be presented to the Board of Supervisors along with the recommendations of your commission and the Montecito Planning Commission when this ordinance amendment does get to the board. Commissioner Brown. Um, just to follow on from Commissioner Valencia's question, uh, it could be the case that somebody has um, a 10-acre site and they want to put an acre's worth of freestanding solar systems. That's no environmental review nothing or two acres i mean what I, I mean i don't have any sense for what it might be for a, a system to power your home on a freestanding if it's can, do you have any experience with any of this i i mean i don't have any experience but i could just envision something that if i'm recalling correctly from the workshop that we did well, actually from the montecito planning commission um a solar array of approximately 10 feet by 30 feet is typically sufficient to provide electricity for a typical single-family house. But in Montecito, that could be 10,000 square foot house would require 
It could be much larger. That's could correct. Could be much larger. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Valencia. Suppose he had a a home use permit to do something in additional, you know, things out of his house, work out of his house. So he needed this extra energy to heat up water or whatever for what he was doing. He could have a business there in the back of his yard, which is allowed by law with a permit. And then he would have an excessive amount of these panels, heating water or steam, whatever he needed. I mean, we're, we're really headed for trouble. Commissioner Cooney. I, I feel like I'm fueling a fire here that uh, we can't put out anyhow, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I see a situation in our neighborhood where um, an old installation, uh, many years old, uh, is um, very obviously um, uh, available to be seen from throughout the South County. And uh, these are big panels, big 10 by 20 panels that that were part of the original technology. And uh, I don't see any requirement that we can impose to require um, installations that initially are very large to be reduced as the technology improves. Uh, I, I feel someday uh, you're going to be able to focus a ray, uh, a sun ray down to create a great deal more energy in a small space, but I, I don't see anything in our ordinance uh, or in the complex of uh, regulation that the county's involved in that will require a homeowner to replace old technology with new. So uh, this is a concern I have all from the aesthetic standpoint, I admit it, but uh, what we're balancing all the time on the Planning Commission is the right of uh, people to develop their property against uh, the effect on the surrounding community. So. Uh, what I see here, and I agree with Ms. Van Mullum, uh, the, the state has uh, decided that issue for us and, and said close your eyes to the aesthetic issues. Mr. Chair, if I, if I go ahead. you know, this is what they told us. Remember when they told us to make substandard streets, to make substandard lots, to allow granny housing, deterioration of neighborhoods. And this is another step of that 300-mile screwdriver that the state assembly uses to Torque the communities, you know. I mean, some of these things. I know people that have uh, uh, welding facilities there in their garages, and when they turn on their things have to do welding, you know, power <laughs> in the surrounding neighborhood just takes a dip, you know. Or the people that have uh, other, other these big uh, radio communications processes, you know, they have these antennas that look like a, a, a antenna farm. You know, and they, they say, no, we don't bother the neighbors, but everybody that has a TV around there that isn't on cable has a problem, can't receive anything. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that the state has jumped into something here that trying to give everybody just rights, uh, property rights, sometimes by giving somebody property rights, they, they Im impose on other people's rights. Say, you know, we need to tread lightly on this, what we're doing here. And I know that it's a mandate and you're just trying to meet the mandates but yes maybe by ourselves we need to tell our assemblymen and state senators beware of what you're doing because you're creating as many problems as you're solving commissioner brown you know i i do wonder in the neighborhoods where commissioner valencia and i live that these will be limited because they're going to be limited as to you can't do your whole, you could do your whole backyard, but you'd have no backyard. So the problems would probably occur in areas where Commissioner Cooney lives, where they have lots, lots of property or in the, and perhaps out in the rural areas where you could install huge vast arrays. So actually, I, just for my comment, I, I don't think that's the case. I mean, the technology is changing so fast. Right. And the price is becoming so much cheaper, and the government's so willing to subsidize them. I think you will find them more frequently in your neighborhoods than you will on the on the larger properties. But I think they'll be limited to probably backyards, or probably they'll all be roof yeah. mounted, and that's we yeah. we see that now. So that's not objectionable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Brooks. Yes, thank you, Chair Blau. Uh, I am all for alternative energy sources. Um, I'll begin with that comment. Somebody tell me since. Uh, 
There seems to be, again, this double standard. We have our coastal act. What is the uh, definition? How far in does the coastal boundary go? M Mr. Chair and Commissioner Brooks, it's not a, a specific distance. There's a line on a map that we use that was certified by the commission. In Carpinteria, it goes pretty much to the top of the foothills. In um, Goleta, it's about Hollister. Um, on the Gaviota Coast, it's just north of Highway 101. Mm -hmm. So it, it varies. All of Bixby and Coho are included in the coastal, pretty much all of Bixby and Coho. So it relates to the location of the first public road, unless it was certified in a different way. It's at least northward of, or inward of the first public road from the, from okay. the beach. Thank you for Mr. clarifying Chair, that for me. Mr. Chair and Commissioner Brown, the, the Coastal zone boundary is nominally a thousand yards. However, it can be adjusted inward and, and outward based on uh, resource considerations. And as Ms. Black mentioned, the Carpentry Valley, um, the agricultural resources are felt to you know, require higher protection under the Coastal Act. And so the boundary was adjusted much further inland to take care of those particular um, growing areas. Similarly, Halama, Coho, Bixby. Uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base and much of the uh, you know area north of there is also included in the coastal zone, which is much further than just a thousand yards inland. Okay, thank you for that clarification. That makes me think I wish I lived in the coastal zone. <laughs> <laughs> not until maybe you get not. A permit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I I'm thinking of um, a utility. Uh, I know. Uh, the solar energy companies are out there advocating, you know, to uh, help absorb some of these electrical costs from utilities. Um, and if a utility uh, wants to go solar, you're looking at, I, I know of one case that I've studied that's four acres, four acres of uh, solar panels. So I think it's coming. You know, we might, even though you know, you need the space, you need the acreage, but in, it, if, if the acreage can be obtained, you know, there might be more of these fields of solar panels, you know, than, than we're thinking. I have a hard time thinking that if you're going to put in four acres of solar panels that, you know, the state is saying, well, yes, that's how it goes. Mr. Chair and C Commissioner Brooks, what we're addressing here is those systems that are accessory and ancillary to a piece of property, to the primary use of that property. It's not meant to be for commercial enterprises where somebody goes up, where somebody goes into a piece of property, sets up a solar furnace, for example, and then starts selling energy to, to people. So this, this would not accommodate those, that particular type of installation. That would have to be done under a whole separate permit process. But don't be surprised when the state gets around to tell us how they're going to regulate that as well. Great. Uh, are, we, are we concluded or are we ready to go? I've concluded with my presentation. I just wanted to mention that um, uh, Ms. Oakland just passed out for me a short memo to your commission with uh, two very minor corrections to the ordinance that was included in your packet. Uh, both of those are in um, Section 4, and it regards inserting the building official into those two paragraphs that, to take care of uh, appeal situations. Thank you. So I think we are ready for a motion uh, on this item. Commissioner Cooney. Um, just a couple of things on the language of the ordinance. I, kn I know, um, well, I shouldn't say I know. Um, I assume this is a work in progress, Mr. Langle, and that um, you would uh, welcome contributions. But since we're making a recommendation today, I'll just mention a couple that I saw in passing. <coughs> um, Looking now at the language of the proposed ordinance, which is uh, our Exhibit 1 <clears throat> on uh, Attachment C, page 4, um, down at the bottom of the page, uh, there's a paragraph referring to inland area with some strikeouts and then some additional language. I, I think the last line of that uh, paragraph B on page 4 needs to be revised, either to put a period after permit approval and then start with a new rather than just flow through however. <clears throat> That's more or less an English uh, <clears throat> use issue. 
um, on page five, um, there's a word missing in uh, paragraph 1C at the bottom of the page. Um, second to the last line, it said, uh, official may approve the application subject conditions. You want to put two in there. And, um, and then since you list the conditions after this introductory paragraph, I think a colon would be appropriate after following findings. That's all I have. Thank you for those comments. I appreciate the review. So Commissioner Cooney, was that a motion to uh, move this forward? It was. With those recommendations and also the memorandum for items 1B and 2D? I'm moving staff's recommendation. Mr. Chair, I know this is probably a technicality, but if you could just call for public comment in case there's somebody in Santa Barbara. Excuse me, I will ask now for public comment. Sinks. Oh, there is one. Oh, yeah, hello, I'm sorry. Oh, There's great. There's a staff person there to take comment slips, but I just wanted to mention a couple things, if you don't mind. Sure. We, we do need to get a speaker slip from you before before you leave, if you could. If you could, Thank you. If you could just state your name for the record and then turn in a speaker slip to the reception desk on the first floor, if you know where that is. That. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my name's Megan Burney. I'm with the Community Environmental Council, and I want to thank staff and the commission for looking at this new solar ordinance. Um, we support staff recommendations and um, support the exemptions for uh, public health and safety. But we do have several concerns, um, mainly surrounding some of the commission's um, concerns about aesthetic and, and size. In particular, there was mention of glare of solar systems. And the purpose of a solar system is actually to absorb light and not reflect it. And there are several solar systems installed on airports and Air Force bases across the country. And I'd be happy to provide staff with more information about those because glare really is not a large problem. While it could be a small problem in specific circumstances, but I don't necessarily think that is something that should be considered a health and safety code in all instances, just in specific ones. Um, also, I would encourage staff to limit grounds of appeal in the coastal zone to um, to public health and safety, mainly because the, the goal of the Coastal Act is to protect resources and solar installations in their very nature do just that. They protect resources and they do very little to impact resources like habitats and species. Um, also, in regards to the square footage requirements that you are all talking about, I actually think that we should encourage people to offset their entire electricity load from solar. Um, solar's been around for about 30 years, and the technology is getting better, but, but not by leaps and bounds. And actually, the technology that we're seeing is, um, is lighter and smaller, things like thin film, but that actually takes more area than our traditional panels. So uh, that's something to really take into account, and especially in our time when we're talking about such things as energy independence and climate change, we should really encourage people to take this per personal responsibility that they are trying to do um, with their solar panels and not discourage them simply because we don't like the way it looks. We don't limit the size of houses. Um, you know, if a house in Montecito is 6,000 or 10,000 square feet, I think we should actually require them to have solar instead of limit their solar, and, and we don't limit people's size of pools, so we really probably shouldn't limit the size of their solar installations. It just seems a little counterproductive for where we're trying to go moving in the future. Um, but I, I sincerely support the staff recommendations. I think this is a great ordinance, and I think it will put the County of Santa Barbara um, in an excellent place to become more independent from our uh, dependence on fossil fuels. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any further comment from speakers? Seeing none, I'll close this public hearing and bring it back for Commissioner Cooney's motion. <laughs> My motion, Mr. Chair, is uh, covered on uh, the first page of the staff report uh, dated uh, March 31, 2009. And uh, it's uh, modified only by the um, additional suggestion changes and amendments made at this meeting today by the commission. And I'm assuming you're including the memorandum that was delivered to us a few minutes ago? for items 1B oh, and yes. 2D. Yes, in, including the um, amendments suggested by uh, Mr. Langle in the April 8, 2009 memorandum circulated today. And I'll second that. Great. Any further discussion? Seeing no lights. Ms. Oppen, will you read the roll? Commissioner Cooney? Aye. Commissioner Brown? Aye. Commissioner Brooks? Aye. Commissioner Valencia? Aye. Commissioner Blau? Aye. Vote carries 5-0. Uh, we conclude. Thank you very much.